It came to pass when Javan King of Hazor, who was a rather important guy and a pivotal character in the story, though it is entirely thine own fault that thou hast not heard the book up to this point, when he heard those things that he sent to, well, what he sent is never specified, a whole bunch of local political and military leaders said, I will not bother to listen to this narrative, and they went out. They and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore, were selling to sell seashells, with horses and chariots, very many and tanks, and rocket launchers, and weapons of mass destruction, and no, this is not a run-on sentence. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Miram, which of course is the location the viewer can find on any map of modern-day Israel. And the kings, who pitched their tents around Jabin, had a mighty fine time, playing volleyball, roasting barbecue, drinking beer, and telling unto one another that the fish they caught was this big. And the Lord did tap on Joshua's left shoulder, even though she was standing by his right side. And Joshua did turn to his left and found not the person who tapped his shoulder. And the Lord said to Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time will I deliver them all up slain before Israel, and none of thy people shall be required to do a single bloody thing other than absolutely everything. Then, after thou doest absolutely everything, thou shalt hold their horses and burn their chariots with fire. After all, all their horses are sinful horses, who shall be punished for all the evil little things that horses do from time to time. You know what I don't talk about. They go out late at night, eating all the hay in town, drinking profusely from that secret hidden place down by the stream, and I also suspect they may be communists. So hold those horses, for all those sinful little things that horses tend to do, and they ought to be bloody grateful that thou art not to kill them. Like thou hast killed every other breathing thing in some of the other villages, including the house plants. So Joshua came, and all the people fore with them against them by the waters of Miram suddenly, and they fell upon them. Of course, we know not who they are and who them are that they fell upon, so we have to assume that this verse means that the Persian army fell upon King Leonidas at Thermopylae. And the Lord delivered them, whoever they are, into the hand of Israel who smote them and chased them unto great Zidon, and unto Misrethrium, and unto the valley of Mispah eastward. And of course the viewer is fully aware of where all these places are and how to properly pronounce them. And they smote them, that is, that the Persians smote King Leonidas and his three hundred Spartans, until they left none of them remaining. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hold their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. And Joshua then turned to the zebras and said in a low, menacing voice, you're next. And Joshua at that time turned back and smote Hazor, and smote the king thereof with the sword, for one very important reason that justifies all this carnage. Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms. And in no time does this verse read like some sort of interpolation edited into the text after the fact to suit a political agenda. And they smote all the souls that were in with the edge of the sword, the destroying them because the broad side of the sword just doesn't get the job done. There was not any left to breathe, and you burnt Hazor with fire. Take that, the beforehand head of all those kingdoms. That will teach you not to do uh, whatever bloody hell it was that they did. And all the cities of those kings. Yeah, those kings. The ones over there. They know what they did. Uh, all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword and he utterly destroyed them, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. And there you have it. This verse absolutely proves that Todd never commanded such things. Joshua was merely doing what Moses commanded him, and in no way doth this contradict anything that is written in previous episodes, nor anything that might follow later in this one. Since Todd commanded Moses, Moses commanded Joshua, this gives a degree of separation between Todd and Joshua, so that Joshua gets all the blame, and Todd gets exonerated. But as for those cities that stood still in their strength, because Joshua was not able to conquer them, because they were big, burly brutes with very large chariots of iron, 
Israel burned none of them, save his or only. That did Joshua burn, and once again, in a way, is this an interpolation inserted into the text after the fact? And all the spoils of these cities and cattle and the children of Israel took for a pay unto themselves, mostly because the adults of Israel told them that they would not get in trouble if they were caught stealing from the local store. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they utterly destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. So, unlike previous accounts of the story, this time they apparently spared the innocent women and children whom they forced to become sex slaves. Were we not merciful? As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. Therefore the Lord was immune from prosecution. Moses was decent enough to die before these brutal acts of mass murder, so Joshua took all the blame. He left nothing undone that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took all that land, the hills, and the south country, and all the land of Goshen, and the valley, and the plain, and the mountain of Israel, and the valley of the same, and the Lord was pleased with the word, and was repeated enough times in this verse, but was considerably wrought that cattle were not listed. Even from all these places that were so unimportant that I am not even going to read them, and all the kings he took, and smote them, and slew them, and pre-made them, and mixed their ashes with gunpowder, and made fireworks out of them, and lighted them off, and boy was it beautiful, Thou should have seen it, I tell us thee what. Joshua made war a long time with those kings, though this 3,000 year old book of stupid specifieth not how long the war actually was, not that it mattered much anyway, thou art just going to have to take my word for it. It was a long time, trustest thou me. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, none of them, not one. Oh yeah, the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon did, but that's it. Nobody else made peace with Israel, all other they took in battle. But at least we have established that the Lord taught Almighty, the creator of the universe, who is always benevolent and good and holy and righteous, had absolutely nothing to do with the violence and destruction, and did not take any actions in the warfare, and did not command the Israelites to commit mass murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. This being the case, the following is one of those verses that simply does not exist. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. And even though the following two verses mention a certain nondescript ethnic group that was apparently bugger all worth mentioning up to this point, there is absolutely no way that these verses are interpolations edited into the text after the fact. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims, so that they would not go up to become Darth Vader's. From the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anam, and from all the mountains of Judah, a place named that did not exist when this event would have happened. And from all the mountains of Israel, Judah and Israel would have not been separate locations until much later in their history, Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. There was none of the Anakims, surnamed Skywalkers, left in the land of all the children of Israel. None of them. Not a one. They were all killed. Well, okay, only in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod there remained, and in no way does this 3,000 year old book of stupid directly contradict itself within a single verse. And the Anakims did wear black capes and black helmets and wear devices that helped them breathe, and they did speak with voices that did sound remarkably like James Earl Jones. And they did tell Luke that they were his father. So Joshua took the land, as I have already explained to thee early in this chapter, according to all that the Lord had said unto Moses, as I cannot stress the point enough that none of this was the Lord's fault. And Joshua gave it to an inheritance unto Israel, according to their divisions by the tribes, which this 3,000 year old book of stupid will spend the next 12 chapters explaining in excruciating detail. And the land rested from war. And the viewer shall rest from this video series. Honestly, the rest of this book is not worth reading, so I'm just going to cut off this series here. Sure, there's an interesting bit about how Caleb was butt hurt because he came all this way hacking and slicing but never received a damn bit of credit. And now he wanted to build his own retirement community on the top of the mountain. And there was that other part where the Israelites didn't like the altar that some of the other Israelites made and wanted to kill them because they were not allowed to worship Todd the same way that they worshiped Todd. Oh yeah, and the part where the tabernacle of the congregation mysteriously materializes in the build camp, life going on as normal, even though it was also bugger all worth mentioning up until that point. 
and the part where Joshua kicks the bucket, and yet the story keeps going. But don't worry, literally judges is much, much better. Well, in certain places at least. Such as the He-Man who loses his power because of a bad haircut. And the man who cuts his girlfriend into pieces in an act which would make Jeffrey Dahmer jealous. And that bit about the hundreds of people who get killed because he can't pronounce a certain word. And that guy who sacrifices his own daughter because Todd Almighty gave him a military victory. Stay tuned. Up to the walls of Jericho, smart on in and hang. Go blow them a hard time, guys, you way. The battle is in my head. Hallelujah. Got your pistol battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Got your pistol battle.